called to pick up back there. Everybody got a copy of that article called, Is Your Modern Translation Corrupt? Right? Um, this is, I think, a good, it's readable, scholarly uh, address regarding what is really a concern, I think, today amongst Christians. We Christians are such silly creatures. We tend to want to spend all of our time trying to chew the limbs off of each other instead of either honoring God or dealing with real problems. And one of the examples of that, there is a very a vehement, a, an angry campaign by many people to say that the King James Bible is the only Bible that anybody ought to use. And that, in fact, other Bibles are the tools of Satan. Other versions or translations of the tools of Satan. In fact, the writer of this article, James White, who's a professor, um, he quotes um, one, oh, where is it? He quotes one writer whose article is entitled Satan's, Satan something or other, okay? Um, Synagogue of Satan, there it is. Uh, Baptist writer William P. Grady wrote a thing called Synagogue of Satan, in which he says that all, uh, all other translations of the Bible except, except the King James Version are uh, non-Christian, they're contrary to the will of God, they're not uh, ordained of God, etc. This article, I encourage you to spend some time with it. I want to uh, talk to a couple of points in it, but I want you to read it because it's a thoughtful response to that. Um, he starts out the, 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 under the summary paragraph, the King James only advocates, meaning the people who believe the King James is the only version that we should read, argue that all modern translations of the New Testament are based on Greek manuscripts that contain intentional doctrinal corruptions. He refers to some of the people as the Grady, for instance, says that, that other translations use uh, original Greek documents that came from Alexandria in Egypt. And Egypt was known for being unholy and da da da. Well, you know what? All of the Greek scholars that, that translated the Hebrew scriptures into, uh, or all, all of the Jewish scholars that translated the Hebrew um, scriptures into Greek in the, the third century BC, and the Septuagint is considered one of the most authorized, they did it in Alexandria. All right? Alexander, from the very first that he, he founded the city of Alexandria, this is Alexander the Great, Greece. He invited the Jews, a lot of Jews from the Holy Land, which he had just conquered the, the previous week, uh, to come to Alexandria because of their scholarship and everything else. And so there has always been a tradition of scholars, especially religious scholars, working in Alexandria. And so I really appreciate this article by James White because he both brings out some of the issues and he also, in a balanced way, not by calling people names or accusing people of being servants of Satan or the sort of things that some of these folks do, he identifies the fact that the modern <coughs> translations, be it the NIV, which is what I use and we use and we're going to talk about today, the New International Version, or the New American Standard Version, which is the version that I used before I started using the NIV, or the, the New Revised Standard Version, which is the version I used before I started using the New American Standard before I started using the NIV, um, that they actually, the modern versions, used more of the ancient, uh, of the original texts that are available, none of the original texts are available, but the oldest texts available, that modern scholarship has actually done a better job of taking all of the resources and materials that are available and working very hard at them to try to make sure we have the best translations as possible, the best translation, close meaning closest to the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. I believe that the modern translations, and I think that, that James White brings this out, do a better job of that than the King James. That it is more prejudice than reason that causes people to say that. They pick out one verse and they say, oh well, they took it. For instance, he talks about in here that they take out in his blood is a phrase that's used in the King James and it doesn't appear in other modern translations. And they say that's an intentional denial of the blood of Jesus. Well, the reason is because the oldest documents that we have in Greek don't have that in them. That it was something that got added by the guys who did the King James Version and that in other places, in the NIV and the NASB and NRSV, they do have the expression, the blood of Christ. They don't deny the blood of Christ. It's just in that particular place, the best documents don't have it there. Where there are disparate or different readings, the modern translations will almost always decide what they think is the best one based upon a lot of things, but two primary things. Which, which documents do they have that are oldest? Because it's more likely the oldest ones are going to be closest to the original, right? And also, which do they, uh, what 
if they have multiple documents and most of them say one thing and one of them, especially a more recent one, says something different, then it's likely that the, the, the great number, the, 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 the more numerous, are going to be more correct. And so they, there's always a process of making those kind of decisions when people are translating the Bible. And I believe the modern scholars, for instance, when there are variant texts, they almost always have to choose, but then in the footnotes they will tell you there's a variant reading of this from the Masoretic text or from whatever, and here's what it said. So, please read this article. It both gives you, I think, a good overview of what the process is whereby translation occurs, and it also will, will discount. I've had, I've had several people say to me, I can't believe you used the NIV. Well, I think the NIV is not only the most readable, I think it's the most scholarly that's available. I don't agree with all of the choices that the editors made. One of the ones in the, new, the latest versions, and NIV continues to be revised, that's part of the philosophy line, uh, the last couple of versions that they've done, they changed the 23rd Psalm. Because there's a variant, uh, the, the way it reads when it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. A legitimate alternate translation of that, which some scholars have made over the, the 2,000 years, is, Yea, though I walk through the valley of great darkness, I will fear no evil. There's no theological difference there. I mean, that's not a point about the divinity of Jesus or anything like that. But um, they feel like it's pro there's probably more evidence for translating that particular Hebrew passage as, Yea, though I walk through uh, the valley of great darkness, or a very dark valley, but however they do it. And I wish they hadn't, because the valley of the shadow of death has more punch for me. But it's not because they're bad scholars. It's not because they were trying to change the meaning. They're trying to be as accurate as they can. So I may not agree with everything. They, the NIV, they went through one version called the TNIV, today's New International Version. And in that version, they went a little too far on gender neutrality. Okay? The fact is that frequently when we, in, like in the King James, when it says man or, or son, not the son of God, but when it says man or son or whatever, it's because Hebrew, like a lot of languages, if any of you all have studied German, for instance, has a neuter pronoun. There's he, there's she, and then there's, there's it, but not it in the same way. It's a personal um, neuter pronoun. And so, because of the tradition, King James always translates that, you know, um, man. Well, the scholars today are trying to figure out how can we be accurate and yet inclusive. Now, some of the very liberal translators had taken things like, you know, um, that they started calling, instead of Jesus being the Son of God, he's the child of God. Right? No, the word actually there is son. So keep the word. But when the word is a neuter gender, and the, the idea, an example of that would be, uh, let us make man in our own image. The word there doesn't mean a male, it means a person. And so the NIV has struggled with how to, and, and immediately in the rest of that it says, so male and female, he created them. And so some people have a heart, heartburn with those changes, and yet most of the changes, I think the TNIV went a little too far with that. But the new 2011 translation, which is what the study Bibles you have are, I think balanced some of that out. There are some scholars who don't agree with all the things that the NIV has done, but there are scholars who disagree with every translation that's ever been done. Overall, the scholarship behind the NIV or the NRSV or the, uh, the New American Standard Version, the NRSV is New Revised Standard Version, overall is better using more, more documentation, more scholarship than the King James did. King James is beautiful. I don't have a problem with it, but from a, a study point of view, it's not the best version to use, both because the language is archaic and also because it doesn't use the best documentation. Is that fair? Any questions about that, Ron? Just confirmation that C.S. Lewis said the same thing, and he had two or three PhDs in language. Yeah. How is a man uh, going to going to understand 16th century English? Yeah. Well, in fact, the reason why the NIV came to be, um, a an electrical engineer in Seattle named Howard Long loved the Word of God and he loved to study it, but when he tried to teach Bible studies, he was, he was disappointed that other people couldn't get into the, the English that's used in the King James Version. So he had a vision for getting a new translation. That led to a meeting in Illinois, it led to the what was then the New York Bible Society, it's now Biblica, 
They were New York Bible Society, then they, they became International Bible Society, and they were a client of mine for a number of years. Now they're called Biblica. They agreed to defund it. They got a, a wonderful group of evangelical scholars. This is a, the NIV was translated and created by evangelical scholars. They're scholars, but they are evangelical. They're conservative in their, in their religious beliefs. For instance, when you read the footnotes and the, the notes and stuff like that, which we're going to talk about those things today, um, you will find that they use the much more the conservative dating of things. You know, they don't say, well, you know, Paul didn't actually write this stuff because it was written in the 300s. No. All of Paul's writing was written, you know, from the, the late 40s, early 50s, over the next 15 years or so. They all they give variant dates if there's strong disagreement on it, but they would they this Bible, the NIV, all of the notes tend to take a more conservative approach. Carolyn, where did Carolyn go? I thought she was gonna be a class. Um, I was just talking to her about this. I'm watching a series of DVDs now in my spare time on um, the Holy Land. And the scholar, the woman who's the speaker, who's from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, in talking about the history, and this is an example of where, where it gets kind of strange. She says, the question she's asking at this point in these, these uh, it's like 12 hours of lectures, is how reliable is the Old Testament as a historical document? And she gives some examples where it does seem to be reliable. But it's interesting, she gives an example where I disagree with her for, for an obvious reason. She says that the uh, Israelites entered Canaan, you know, Moses dies, but then Joshua and the Israelites enter Canaan. She says they enter about 1200 BC. Well, the traditional date, based upon what scripture, internal evidence in Scripture, is about 1440, not 1200. 240 years earlier is the traditional number, rather than the one that she uses, which is a much more liberal translation. She says that when they entered, entered Canaan, one of the first stories is that they destroyed the walls of the city of Jericho, right? Remember that? They walk around the walls every day and they blow their horns and finally they shout and blow the horns and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. Well, they found Jericho a number of years ago. There really was an ancient city and it really did have a wall that apparently had been destroyed. But this scholar, Jody Magnus, who's a great lecturer, she's really good, she says, well, yes, they found Jericho and they found a wall, but... All the evidence is that the wall was, had been uh, disused and not in use for a couple of hundred years before the Israelites entered Canaan. Well, the date she picks for when the Israelites entered Canaan is 240 years later than the traditional view. And I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, well, Jody, 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 <laughs> you've just made an argument for the fact that the dating of the entry of Canaan probably ought to be 240 years earlier than what you said. Okay. I heard an, ex an expression once, that, uh, or an illustration once, that is very funny. The, the radical scientists, and I am not against science, I, I love science, but, but I talk about sometimes in classes, scientism, people who are so addicted to science as the only source of truth and the only source of knowledge that discounts faith and discount the faith documents <coughs> and religion and all that kind of stuff. The scientism folks... Um, they sometimes have said things like, well, here we have a 200 million year old fossil. <laughs> they go, well, how do you know it's 200 million years old? <clears throat> well, we found it in a layer of sediment that was 200 million years old. Well, how do you know the sediment was 200 million years old? Well, duh, we just told you it had a 200 million year old fossil in it. <laughs> now, that sounds absurd. And, and, and it, it's extreme, but I actually have read arguments that sound very much like that. So we need to be careful. We need to have some humility. We need to recognize that there are differences in scholarship. But the NIV Study Bible, one of the reasons I like it, is it is the product of evangelical scholars who take the Word of God seriously, believe that it is God's Word to us, and yet they're scholars. And so you'll hear balancing things in it. Any questions or comments about any of that? Anybody? Okay. So you're saying that some of them are not uh, scholars. No, some of them are not conservative Bible scholars. Anybody who translates from the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic into English has got to be a scholar, and by definition they're a Bible scholar, but they may not be a conservative Bible scholar or an evangelical Bible scholar. And as I said earlier, I, I could give you a much more of a historical definition, but to me evangelical means to believe that Jesus Christ was the divine Son of God who died for our on our behalf to take away our sins, that he really died, he was really resurrected, that he was... He um, ascended to the right hand of the Father. He is coming again. 
I believe this Bible is God's word to us. Uh, miracles really do happen. There really is a supernatural world. To me, that's what an evangelical is. All right? I won't get into the difference of evangelical and fundamentalist right now because some of that is historical, what's happened in history. But um, that's where I'm coming from. All right? Let's get into our much more lesson for today. Um, this is the outline for our class. And today we're on week three. Do you believe this? We're three weeks into the same week class. Um, of course. Today I want to talk about the NIV Study Bible. Um, the NIV Study Bible, I'm going to tell you as we go along why I recommend it. I'm not the only one that recommends it. Rick Warren, for instance, um, Saddleback Church, big, Pastor of the Biggest Church in America, he recommends it, and there's several reasons. There are a lot of other scholars who recommend it. It is the most popular translation, English translation of the Bible in the world today. More people read the NIV than any other. The NIV Study Bible, which we specifically are going to talk about, is the most popular study Bible in the world, by far. There are more people using it than any other. And I want to spend today walking through this study Bible with you and telling you why I think this is an extraordinary book, why it's worth toting this 19-pound thing around. <laughs> Um, and that, well, let me get into some of the some of some of this. Last week, I was telling you that here are some steps that you need to take in order to take personal Bible study seriously. Some of the basic, and I've added to this a little bit to compress some things. First, you need to set aside time for Bible study. If you don't do that, nothing will happen. In the same way that if you have a hobby, if you're going to practice that hobby, you set aside time for it. 7 o'clock on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right? And, you know, for golfing, right, uh, Arnie? Or whatever else it is. You have to set aside time. Secondly, you have to pray before and after every Bible study time. And this is one of the reasons, too, that I don't put too much countenance in people who, who argue that, oh, you can't trust the NIV. You know, the Holy Spirit has not given up on being active in the world. And for this to purport to be God's Word, He's involved in that, too, both in creating it and in helping us understand it. The third thing is that we need to learn how to write, ask the right questions, we talked about the stages of observation, seeing what the Bible says, of interpretation, figuring out what the Bible means, of meditation, thinking about how this affects me, how is this relevant to my life, and then application, how do I use it in my life. All of this stuff, by the way, is online. For those of you who hadn't picked up on that, if you did not get the email telling you how to access all of the notes that are online, See me at the break, and I'll make sure that we figure out why you didn't, and we'll get you that email. Because all of this stuff is available on the internet. The fourth reason, a uh, fourth um, step, is to write down your thoughts, observations, interpretations, questions, applications, etc. You will not grow optimally unless you write stuff down. Partly because that's how you learn. That's an additional way how you learn. Uh, all the people who study didactics, that is teaching, will say when you hear things you learn it partly. When you see things, you learn it partly, which is one of the reasons I use overheads. When you write things, you actually use a different part of the brain, and in each of those different ways, you are sort of cementing your knowledge and understanding of this. So writing this down is critically important. And then finally, you need to make sure you have the right tools to do serious Bible study. I mentioned to you the tools I believed you needed to have were two Bibles in the same good translation, one of them without notes, as a reading Bible. The, the first level for any Christian is we should be reading the Bible every day. Every day as a personal devotional time. And most of you have heard me say, I get up in the morning, usually at 5.30. I go downstairs, I give the dog their morning treat. I make, I make myself a cup of espresso. I go in, I sit down in the same place on the end of the sofa and turn on the, the table lamp. And I pick up my NIV uh, it's an NIV travel Bible, so it doesn't have any footnotes or anything. It's got the, the center column references, which I don't look at. And I read, and I just read. And I read until I've read enough. I don't have a goal. I don't have to read ten chapters. You know, I don't, I'm not in a rush. I don't, I'm not trying to get anything else done, which is why for me, I'm a morning person. That's why I do it at 5.30 in the morning. For some people, if you're not a morning person, don't try that. You'll kill yourself. Do it at midday, or do it at night, or do it whenever you have the right time. It's set aside a time. And the first level of Bible study is you should simply be reading. Just let it pour through you. Don't worry about it. When you read something that strikes you, stop and think about it. Pray about it. You know, I always start with prayer, end with prayer. But just let, let the Word of God soak through you. And I read, and it could be five chapters or ten chapters or a whole book, <coughs> depending upon when the Spirit says to me that's enough for today. 
And then I close in prayer, and I fold up the book, put it down, turn off the light, and go start my day. All right? Now, that's the basic level of sort of personal devotional Bible study, and everybody ought to be doing that. I recommend you have a copy of the Bible that does not have footnotes and study aids and all that, because they just get in your way. You have to stumble over or distract you for that kind of study. Then there's two other levels of study I'll mention in a second. But so I think two, book, two, two versions of the same translation of a Bible, one just a reading Bible, and if you don't have a good reading Bible, I will give you one at the break. I will give you an NIV study Bible, large print, or an, I'm sorry, an NIV Bible, large print, that you can just use as a reading Bible. Just tell me you want one, okay? Second, a loose leaf notebook, loose leaf, so that you can put pages in and out, spiral bound, you know, if you want to take something out and work on it, or you, you, you know, you're away from your desk and, you know, you're, uh, something occurs to you in terms of, you can't stick it in there, all right? So that's why I recommend loose leaf. And then basic Bible study tools. Two or more additional Bible translations, like I say, all Bible translations, the scholars who did it make decisions about how that's going to be, a particular passage is going to be translated. It's helpful to have multiple versions. In fact, I'd recommend, like for me, the two Bibles in the same good translation are my NIV Reading Bible and my NIV Study Bible. But then I have many other translations. I would recommend maybe a good additional Bible like New American Standard or a... Um, New Revised Standard, and then maybe a good paraphrase, like The Message by Eugene Peterson, or um, The Living Bible. Okay, those, that gives you just a different kind of understanding so that you're not getting just one set of scholars' opinions about that. An exhaustive concordance, or as I told you, as we used to call them in seminary, the exhausting concordance. This has every word that occurs in the Bible is in this book. And it will tell you everywhere that word shows up in the Bible. So if you look up the word anger here, because you read it in a certain passage, it will tell you about that. It'll tell you that passage. It'll list everywhere else that that word occurs. All right? That's a concordance. We're going to talk about this more. And then a Bible dictionary um, or Bible encyclopedia that just is what a dictionary encyclopedia is. It either tells you what a word, words mean, Bible words mean, or they give you articles about it. And then the topical Bible. A topical Bible doesn't use words from the Bible, but it takes topics. Like, you can look up, perfect example, the word Trinity in here, and it will give you all the Bible passages related to the Trinity, even though the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. Trinity is a theological understanding that we develop, and it's clear why we do it when you study it, but that word doesn't show up, so you can't look it up in the concordance, but you can look it up in a topical Bible. Then a Bible handbook, which is, is sort of a, 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 a combination of bits and pieces of all of that, uh, a commentary. I recommend colored highlighting pens that don't leak through paper. If you use a regular highlighter on a Bible with India paper, like these NIV study Bibles, you'll end up highlighting two passages, the one on the page you're on and the one on the back side of that page. So they, they make dry marker kinds of highlighters. A good Bible atlas. I love maps. I love maps and charts and diagrams and all that kind of stuff. A good Bible atlas. I've got three or four different ones that I like. Word studies for Hebrew Old Testament and Greek New Testament. Every word that, that occurs in the original Greek and Hebrew, they have it there and they will tell you all the different ways in which it appears and what it means in English. So that you can look up, and you can look up the words in English and it will give you all of the different variations in the original languages and what they mean. And then some additional commentaries. I went through all that last week, but I want you to go through that again. Now, you're going, holy moly, I'm going to have to get another room in my house. This really isn't that much, trust me, as somebody who's been <laughs> buying theological books for many, many, many years. Almost everything I'm recommending here in terms of uh, study materials, not the highlighters or whatever, is in the NIV Study Bible, at least to an extent of 90% you know, of everything you would need. Now, it does not have an exhaustive concordance. But it does have the biggest concordance that has ever been bound in with a English language Bible. The concordance, I believe, is 100,000 words. Um, so, for, no, 20,000 words. I'm sorry, I was thinking about footnotes. Um, so let's talk about the particulars of that. First, the three levels I mentioned. We're gonna talk about the middle one today. First, just read, using a Bible without notes. Let the Word of God just pour over you and do that every day. It really will make a difference in your life. I promise you. 
The second, which we're going to talk about today, is to read using a good study Bible, and only that study Bible. And while reading, take time to read the text notes and footnotes and occasionally the cross-references. What does that mean, cross-references and stuff? We're going to look at that. And then the third level, which we're going to get into starting next week more, is to establish the discipline of a full inductive, what I call inductive plus Bible study. An inductive Bible study means to have a disciplined strategy or approach where you're looking at God's Word, the Bible, and letting, through the, we believe, the power of the Holy Spirit, letting it speak to you about what it means and how you can apply it to your life. I say inductive plus because once you have done that first first series of steps where you're reading the Word and figuring out what it means to you and how you apply it to your life, you then go to some other materials and sources to see what other people have had. And I think that sort of adds another dimension to it. But you don't start with what other people said. You start with what God the Holy Spirit is teaching you directly out of the Word. But then you benefit from other people's experience as well because the Spirit has spoken to them also. That's why I call it inductive plus. And in doing that, you um, keep a written notebook of your thoughts, your observations, interpretations, questions, and application. You should minimally be doing the first two of those. If you're serious about growing in your faith, you'll do all three of these. The first one you'll do every day. The second one you'll do several times a week. The third one you might do once a week. But if you're not at least just reading God's Word every day, if you're not at least taking the time with a study Bible to use the resources that are all bound in one book so that you don't have to have a room full of books or a shelf full of books, uh, and taking advantage of that as a resource and tool, then you're not serious about this. Okay? And I think you should be because there is no single thing, and studies have shown this, there is no single thing that will do more to cause a person to grow in the Christian faith, to feel more in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, to feel more of an understanding of what their life in Christ should be than reading the Bible and studying the Bible. Now, the most recent, that's been demonstrated many, many times, the most recent one is Willow Creek Church in Illinois, huge church, not Walnut Creek, Willow Creek. Walnut Creek is in California, Willow, Willow Creek is in Illinois. They did a survey of 250,000 church attenders to identify where people are in their faith walk and what has the most positive, the, what things have the most positive effect. And they determined the Bible is far and away, far and away, the most significant thing. To read and to study the Bible will have a more positive effect on somebody feeling they have a satisfying and fulfilling Christian faith, a more fulfilling walk with the Lord than any other single thing. So you ought to be doing this. Questions about any of that before we jump into the NIV study Bible? Does everybody have, right now, either an NIV study Bible or some kind of study Bible? Does everybody, anybody not have a study Bible, you can either have in front of you or look over somebody's shoulder. Okay, good. Uh, the first part of what I want to do today, and before we take a break, is, is just go through what's in this thing, this, this monster of a, of a volume. Uh, the, the particular kinds of resources, and talk about what they are. And then, in the second half of today's class, I want to take a passage and have us actually use those tools so that you can see what they do and how they come into play. All right? And I'm going to pick John 1, which is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and one that I think is most benefits from looking at uh, resources within the NIV Study Bible to understand what it's talking about. The first thing I would say, um, this table of contents is on page V, if you would like to turn to it. You understand that most books, before they actually get started with the main part of the book, they'll have Roman numeral, small Roman numeral. Uh, and so this table of contents is on Roman numeral V. A couple things I want to point out here. You will notice along the, is it right there? Now, if you don't have an NIV study Bible, you obviously can't turn to this page. But somewhere in your NIV study Bible, there will be a table of contents. So find it if you can or in your study Bible. And if any, I, was, I have a couple of other versions. See, I have other study Bibles, not just other Bibles. This is the New American Standard. This is a master study Bible, which has got some very good materials in it. The Word in Life study Bible, which uses the New King James. Now, some people think, okay, if the King James Bible had problems in translation, they fixed them with the New King James. They didn't. They used the same materials, the same references. All they did was they updated the language. But in terms of the what I believe are some of the less than best 
materials used, the original languages to use, that didn't fix that problem. But there's some benefits to it. I love the language of King James. I really do. In fact, I, I, I have a problem because frequently I will know a verse. I'm notorious, at least to myself. I don't know if other people have noticed it. You probably have. Of remembering the scripture verse and not remembering the passage reference. Okay? Of not being able to say, in fact, I was wanting to refer to the Isaiah 40 passage in a class on Wednesday. They will mount up and wiggle the wings. Like eagles, they will run and not be weary, they will walk and not faint. I know that verse very well, but right there, standing in front of everybody, I could not remember the passage reference. So I'm standing up here with my study Bible, listening, trying to find it because I couldn't refer to it, and I, then I remembered where it was. Um, so I'm really bad about that. And one of the problems I have is that a lot of the scriptures that I remember, I learned them in the King James when I was in a junior council at a Bible camp. And so part of my problem is that I then have the challenge of trying to go from the King James to the versions that I use today and find those in a, a, a concordance or whatever. The computer versions of the Bible are very useful for that because you can flip back and forth. And when you go to a, like from King James to NIV, the concordance changes automatically. So that you're looking up words in that version. I'm going to talk about using the concordance a little bit later. But you were going to touch the Holman. Well, and the Holman uh, Christian Standard Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, this too is a study Bible. It's got a lot of good materials in it, good footnotes. I think it's really good. Uh, this is fairly new. This too is a fairly new translation, so I'd recommend that to you. There are a lot of other options, but I think the NIV Study Bible is the best one. Uh, you'll notice down the left-hand side here, there is a list of um, some, just some of the basic startup stuff. The description of the maps, charts, models, a preface, a quick start guide, introduction to the NIV Study Bible that describe how they got to where, you know, how they did it, how it came to be, uh, abbreviations and translations, ancient texts, uh, etc. But I want you to look just at the table of contents. You'll notice three things about this. First, it obviously lists all of the books of the Bible and tells you what page they're on. In case you're not as smart as Pat and I are, and I have added little tabs to mine. I mean, I know what books of the Bible are. But even I, you know, if I'm in a rush and I'm, you know, somebody asks me a question, I want to get to First Peter really quick and not have to. You know, I have a tendency to go, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, X, Romans, First Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Verse Second, Verse Second, Verse Second, First Peter. <laughs> okay, uh, I still do that, and I've been doing this for over 30 years. Right now, you're probably smarter than me, but um, this tells you exactly what page they're on. That's the first thing. The second thing is you will notice that there is an introduction to every book of the Bible. And I'm going to look at a sample of that in a few minutes. I'm going to take you to John, the Gospel of John. But it will tell you who wrote it, when they wrote it. And again, these are conservative theological evaluations, not the liberal ones. Oh, well, you know, if, if you look up Genesis, it will say Moses is the writer. Not JEPD, like Documentary Hypothesis says, that there are four different writers who wrote much later than Moses lived, and da da da. It takes a conservative theological approach, as I do. Um, so, it will give you an introduction to every book, who wrote it, when they wrote it, what the themes are, it will outline every book for you, it will give you um, relevant information about the circumstances under which it was written, like the, the uh, book of Thessalonians. Uh, first, first, second Thessalonians were written to the church in Thessalonica, in the Macedonia, what we know of as Greece. And part of the reason was that they had been uh, influenced by false teachers who told them that Jesus had already returned, and they missed it. Okay, we'll tell you that about that book, so that you've got an understanding of some of those basic things before you actually get into it, so that it, you know you've got a context that it makes sense in. The third thing I want to mention about this is that you will notice there are a number of both the group essays in this and topical essays as you go along. For instance, right at the top under table of contents, when it says the Old Testament, it says the five books of Moses. I've been talking to you all about the fact that the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, are called the five books of Moses. In Greek, that's Pentateuch, the five books, or the five-part book. In Hebrew, it is Torah, which is law or instruction. Well, there's a little essay there, before you get into specific books, talking about the five books of Moses, to give you an introduction to all of that. Then, if you come down a little bit further, they've got, they, they give you an essay in, uh, to start each of the main groupings of books. 
like the historical books of the Old Testament, starting with Joshua. Then you get the books of poetry before you get into Job, and you get the prophets before you get to Isaiah. So you've got essays that help you understand those as a type of writing. You then have, right underneath the historical books, for instance, you've got the conquest and ethical question of war. People have challenged um, the Hebrew people, the Jews, when they entered Canaan, they conquered this land by sword. They, and they put many of the cities, they put everybody to the sword because God told them to. There's an essay in here that talks about that from a biblical perspective. There are essays here that deal with um, the wisdom literature as part of the books of poetry. All of these are essays, not long essays, a page or two, to give you introductions to all of that. Right? And you're going to stop me if you have any questions as we go along, right? The next page after this, continuing the table of contents, there are more articles like the time between the Testaments, New Testament chronology. Um, and here, on the inside of the left page, you'll see study helps. Tables of weights and measures. How long is a cubit? Okay. 18 inches, because you've heard me say that several times. It's about a foot, unless it's an Egyptian cubit, which is different. Uh, you know, how, all of these other measurements, get an uh, ephah in, in, uh, of grain. You know, how much is that? So the, they've got weights and measures. Then revised spelling of proper names. There are different ways, because all of these are ancient Hebrew and Greek names. When you transliterate them into English, which is what you do with a name, then the spellings may differ. People may disagree on that. And so they explain how, what their thinking is behind it. The index to topics I'm going to talk about, index to notes, concordance, index to maps at the end. Then you have, in addition to all of the, the uh, table of contents, the Gospels in early church, the synoptic Gospels specifically talked about, a harmony of the Gospels, which is a great thing. Uh, if you look on page 1814 in the NIV Study Bible, there is a harmony of the Gospels. You know what that means? They've taken all four of the Gospels, and they have told you which stories or which parables or which passages occur in which Bibles in what order. There are a few, not a lot, but there are a few things that occur in all four of the, of the Gospels. Now, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are all three sort of historical books. They deal with a sequence of events. John's Gospel is not synoptic. Synoptic means same seeing. The first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are synoptic same seeing. They take the same approach. They look at it the same way. John's is a theological work. He's not concerned about what happens so much as what does it mean. But the harmony of the Gospels will tell you what passages, what events, what parables, what sayings, what sermons happen in each of the Bibles, each of the Gospels, so that you can kind of line them up, because they're not necessarily in the same order. Um, Hebrew writers, or any writers of that day, but especially the Hebrew writers, the Jewish writers, Luke is not a Jew, Luke was a Gentile, he's the only Gentile writer of any of the Bible books, um, but they tended not to worry about the order of things, they would, when they're talking about events, they had a different sense of how you write uh, uh, write stories about something that happened. They would con they would put the things they thought were relevant to each other next to each other, whether they came in sequence in time or not. But this NIV harmony, uh, NIV harmony of the Gospels, helps you see how those all fit together. Okay, it's a very valuable tool. Then you get over here to maps after all the books of the Bible, and these are the maps that occur as you go along. There are maps and charts and models all the way through uh, the New International, uh, the NIV Study Bible. Um, for instance, turn to page 1826. 1826. This is something that we talked about in Bible study. On the day of Pentecost, which was when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and the church really was born on the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they spoke in other tongues. And there were people from all over the ancient Near East were in Jerusalem that day because Jews who were spread out all over the eastern end of the Mediterranean um, had come because that was a major festival of the Jewish faith and so they were in Jerusalem. And it says that all of these different people, and it lists them in Acts 2 from all of these different places, 
all heard the, their own language being spoken by these disciples who were, um, who were influenced by the Holy Spirit. Well, if you look at this map, right here on page 1826, the countries of people mentioned at Pentecost. And it tells you Rome, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Pontus, Cappadocia, Mesopotamia, the Parthian Empire, Media, uh, Arabia, Egypt, Cyrene, Judea, Elam, Susa, etc., etc. And you can visually see where all these folks came from and just how wide an influence. Now, the reason that's important is because later on we run into characters who have become Christians and come from Rome, or from Alexandria, or from other places, well, we know why there were Christians in those places. Because all the people who came from those locations to Jerusalem for Pentecost and heard the disciples speaking in their language, and then heard Peter preach the first great sermon of the church, and we had thousands of people who became Christians, those people then went back home to all these places. And so later we get Apollo has come, is a Christian who comes from Alexandria who believes that Jesus is, is the Son of God but doesn't have a lot of other information. You know, and, and so uh, Priscilla and Aquila teach him. We've got people like Priscilla and Aquila come from Rome. Well, how did they get to be Christians in Rome? This is before Paul went to Rome. This little map tells you. And there are maps like that throughout all of it. Paul's missionary journeys and Peter's travels after, you know, from Jerusalem up to Joppa and Caesarea, etc., etc. All of that stuff is in here, okay? Um, questions about any of that? The, the uh, revised spelling of proper names, that, uh, where, why did they do that? I mean, there's two pages of names that you cannot recognize from the original names. They just, it's like, it's like, what, they just take license and just, uh, well, the scholars feel like that the license was taken in the first place, that they did a sloppy job, and so they're trying to make them more accurate transliterations, so that they're, when they're spoken... See, a name doesn't... It's not like a name has a meaning, and then... Uh, I'll give you an example. When I, when I, my father's military, so I lived in Germany for three years as a child. I, when I came back, I was in the seventh grade. Well, all these other seventh graders would come up to me and say, how do you say my name in German? <laughs> And I'd say, well, what's your name? And they'd say, Bill. And I'd go, well, in German, that would be Bill. <laughs> but the point is that if, if you write that in a, in a language that has a different, um, uh, different alphabet, yeah. then sometimes you actually have to make decisions. You know, like double L in Spanish, you know, is pronounced differently. Well, if the point of the name is how it's pronounced, not how it's spelled in that regard. And so you may have to make a different decision if you want to accurately represent the way a name was said, because it doesn't have any meaning apart from the sound of it. Okay. And so those decisions get made. And the scholars who did their, their revision, and they gave you a whole section to try to say, okay, we looked at this and we think that the earlier use of these names was not really accurate to how those names would have been said originally. And so we're using what we believe is a more accurate representation doesn't have any theological content, I mean, any theological import, but that's why. For someone who, who you know, who would be, you have used other versions all their life, it makes these names unrecognizable. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, absolutely unrecognizable. Yeah, I mean, we get things like I mean, the, the, the jump, the jump from what we are, what was existed in the overwhelming literature of translation is so vast and so great, you know, that there's... Well, that's really, there's really, it's really just the King James. I mean, and then others, when it came to proper names after that, they pretty much have followed King James on proper names. The scholars who have come back in more recent, and it's not just the NIV, more recent modern translations, they've gone back to the ancient documents and said, you know, they, the King James did not do a very good job of transliterating this name. An example would be the Pool of Bethesda. All right, we have Bethesda, Maryland, Bethesda Army Hospital, right? Beth Zetha is probably is a better transliteration of the Hebrew word. And we don't recognize that. I don't have any heartburn about it, uh, but yeah, it, it could be frustrating. Hello? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Karen? What's it mean? We need to, <laughs> you need to unplug this. No, no just leave it on. I think it's okay. The light, the light. Well, see, the, the bolt, the, the fan's off. It doesn't matter whether the electricity's going to the bolt or not. This is running. Okay, well, somebody's checking on it. Yes. Um, let's let's keep moving forward here. Um, 
Then you have all these charts. <laughs> if you look on that same page we were just talking about, uh, or actually switch the, go to the next page, which is 8 and 9. And let's let that cool off for a second before we turn the light back on. Ma'am. But these are not, this is more for pronunciation, maybe? Well, a proper name is, is how do you say a proper name? I mean, the, the, the scholars who did this book said this is a better way to transliterate Greek and Hebrew names into English than the, than the way King James did it. So they're trying to be more accurate, and yet it doesn't sound familiar to us. Okay. Thanks, Carolyn, for fixing the lights. No, no, no. Okay. Whoever did it. Guillermo. thank you. He's in there holding the wires together, apparently. Um, all right. Um, we come to the next page, which will hopefully come up in a minute, um, This that has charts. I want you to turn to um, right at the end of this introductory material. I want you to look at a very cool set of charts. This is on page 12, that's XXII and XXIII, which if you know your Roman numerals is 12 and 14. Okay. That's, that's 20. Uh, I'm sorry, 22 and 23, yeah. If you know your Roman numerals like I do. Well, we may have lost the bulb with that little event. Oh, no, there we go. It's coming on now. You don't want to do X, that. XXII and XXIII, 22 and 23. This is a very cool, yeah, a very cool chart which tells you some of the ancient manuscripts, and I actually have it up here, ancient manuscripts that, that are extra biblical. By that we mean it's outside the Bible. Extra means outside of. Extraordinary means outside the ordinary. Um, these are very cool things. This shows the, the, the scholarship, and actually I was just listening to a thing that talked about the uh, Merneptah stele. A stele is a, is a stone, it's a standing stone. And how it mentions the, uh, the nation of Israel. It's the earliest reference we have to Israel as a people. Okay. I only mention this to you, not because I'm going to draw any particular theological content to it this, this, just this minute, but this is a good example that through this book, the NIV Study Bible, it's full of this kind of stuff to help you as background and understanding. And when you get to uh, like a footnote where they're talking about some event, um, they, that if they have extra biblical that outside the Bible, in addition to the Bible, documentation for it, if it's referring to one of these, the footnote will refer you back to this page and say, come back here and look at this. Those of you who are in the Old Testament theology class, on Wednesday, I was talking about the Enuma Elish, which is the Akkadian, ancient Babylonian, creation myth, or epic. Well, it's right here, Enuma Elish, Akkadian, second uh, millennium uh, BC, and it describes in two, two lines what it's all about. So, I believe this is an extraordinary, valuable kind of thing, and it has charts, it has models, um, lots of stuff you can refer to. Let me come back. Yeah, charts. Then models. Have you ever wondered what the tabernacle looked like? Those of you who haven't seen my paintings and pictures of it. Uh, turn to page 134 in the NIV study Bible. On page 134 is uh, a representation and a description of what the tabernacle was. Now the tabernacle was the, the church, if you will, a portable church. It was a tent that had all sorts of um, pieces of furniture that went with it. It was God told the Israelites after he gave them the law, build this tabernacle for me. And it explains all that, and it tells you the passages to look at, that that would be where God lived, so to speak, in the midst of the Israelites. In the Israelite camp, they, they were, there was a particular order that the tribes of Israel camped around this thing. On the right-hand side, you've got an artist's description, or an artist's depiction and a description of the Ark of the Covenant, and then some of the other pieces of furniture that God told them to build to go in the tabernacle. There are a lot of these kinds of uh, charts, diagrams, models throughout the whole Bible. If you go to page 522, you ever wonder what the temple looked like? The 
Temple of Solomon, the first temple. There's a picture, not of the whole courtyards, but just of the, the temple itself on page 523. 22 describes it. And then again, the next page, you get the furnishings, some of which look familiar because they were modeled after the ones that were used in the tabernacle. That's what the temple looked like. I think this stuff is great. I hope you do too. That you can visually get a sense of what this stuff is about. Now, um, if you go back toward the front, something that I believe, again, is very valuable. If you go to XXV, which is 25, <laughs> it's right across from the last page of that ancient text related to the Old Testament. It's the start of an Old Testament chronology. Now, while I say that this is an evangelical work of scholarship, it's not... Um, this, is, this is what I'm talking about right here. It is not... Um, you'll notice they have the four great events of the Old Testament that are depicted in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which is called the prehistoric prologue. The creation, the fall, the flood, and Babel. Those of you who are in our survey of the Old Testament, you, we talked about all four of those, the four great events that happened in prehistory. That is, before they started writing history down. Moses was led by God to write descriptions of these later, but we don't know the exact years. Very conservative Christians say that it happens 6,064 years ago on a Tuesday. But we don't know that for sure. Okay. Um, I'm being a little facetious, only a little. If you, it's not going to be on the test. What day did creation start on? Monday. Um, then if you turn the page, we have this great thing. I, I hand it up. Yes? I have a question about that other page. Okay. What, what is the, all the gray underneath? Does that mean they just... Exactly. I mean, if you turn the page, it'll tell you what the gray means, uh, that the page we're getting ready to come to. What they've done is they're just trying to be consistent visually, and they don't have any other data to put in on that first page since that's prehistoric. But, um, but then we get over to starting with the, the biblical history, about 2500 BC, and you'll notice that they've got traditional dates. And then dates accepted by many scholars. They actually will give you if there's a, if there are a difference. They want it to be, they want to be fair here. Along the top here, you will start seeing the references to the biblical characters and events. The patriarchs. Let me go back one. Oh, I don't even have that. Sorry. Um, if you're on page uh, 26 and 27 in the Roman numerals, it starts with the patriarchs. Let me go on to this one. I, I skipped that because there's a lot of content here. This starts with the Exodus. You can see up here on the upper left, it says Exodus and Conquest, then the time of the Judges. And the Judges include Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, Gibeon, down here you have Samuel is born, Jephthah, Samson. Over here on the left you've got the Exodus happening in 1446, not the 1200s, like I told you that that professor from Chapel Hill said, which is why she can't figure out why the wall of Jericho had come down hundreds of years earlier. Um, 1406, Moses dies, and uh, Joshua is appointed leader. The Israelites enter Canaan, and on and on. Over here, you get the divided kingdom, the kings of Israel, Saul, David, Solomon, divided kingdom, the fall of the northern kingdom, the prophets of Judah, all of the different prophets, and when they wrote, all on this one chart. Then down below, down here, which is what the gray section is, you know, they just carried, they started that earlier. They got the history as it was occurring in southern Mesopotamia. Northern Mesopotamia, Egypt, Syria, Palestine, Anatolia, which was the most ancient name for Asia Minor or modern day Turkey, Crete, Persia, Greece, and Italy. Those were the places where major empires and civilizations grew up. And so along the bottom there, they give you the major events that were happening in each of those regions. They break it down this way because southern Mesopotamia is where Babylon was. Northern Mesopotamia is where um, Assyria was. Both of them in modern day Iraq, or approximately. So you can track through here and say, okay, when David was king, what was happening in the rest of the world? Not a lot. The Sea Peoples, the Phoenicians were there, uh, which just after the late Minoan period, 
um, on the island of Crete, you can see that the um, Dorian states have just really come into the area. Um, eventually, they would occupy Greece, etc., etc. You can see what's happening in the rest of the world. I think this is very cool. Right before the New Testament starts, you get exactly the same thing like this having to do with New Testament history and what was happening historically in the world, as well as the major figures and major events of the New Testament. What was that? Okay. What, what I was talking about? Yeah. Okay. This is, for instance, I said the United Kingdom. First was Saul, then was David, then was Solomon, right? Okay. Got that? If you follow that straight down, okay. you'll see that in uh, southern Mesopotamia, it's hard for me to read. The Middle Assyrian period was going on during the time of Saul and David, and then ended right there. Uh, the Phoenicians, which is one of the Sea Peoples, had settled in Syria, um, Syria, Palestine, which is the ancient name for it. It was well, we well, it's been called so many different names: Palestine, Canaan, Syria, Palestine, depending upon the time period. The name Palestine actually is a is a variant of Philistine, and so Palestine meant the the land of the Philistines. You sometimes wonder why they drop those consonants out of there, but they do. Just like the sons of Shem became the Semites. I don't know why they're not the Shemites. I'm, I probably should look that up someday. Um, and then you get, and you'll notice, like here, the Persian Empire. Persia conquered northern Mesopotamia, southern Mesopotamia, Egypt, Syria, Palestine, Anatolia, Crete, Persia, obviously, and for a short time, Crete, Greece. They control all of that. Well, you can see that right here. And you can see that that happened uh, during the time when Daniel, remember Daniel was in the court of Babylon when the Persians conquered Babylon. And on and on. Okay? All of this begins, to, these pieces begin to make sense to you from there. Okay? Questions? Yes? No, just a comment. Uh, this, kind of, this kind of timeline, this would be something that you'll refer to over and over and over and over again because... This, it, it just puts everything in perspective. And, and uh, years ago, I, I was in a little Bible study, and these little, you know, who was it, Jensen? These little, uh, these yeah. little pocketbook Bible studies by by somebody, Jensen. Well, he does all the New Testament survey books. Yes, and, he, Jensen. and he did this. He did this, yeah. and and it was a revelation to me to see how it all just fit together. Right. Really put things in perspective. So you're saying that the colors. Right, well that's, the reason is because the, the color represents that time period, but the only reason you have breaks in that color is if some other, like Persia, starts out orange. You get over here, Persia has conquered 9 out of 11 of the, of the areas that are listed here historically, and so all of it's colored that. When Persia falls, then the, you know, okay, got it. Some, some other color would take over. <laughs> the colors just represent the different kingdoms so you can tell them apart. Now, was it in this class or the survey class that I handed you out, guys, this Old Testament timeline? The money class. Money class. This is sort of a similar example, and maybe I'll have some more copies of this made and give them to you all if you didn't get one. This is an Old Testament timeline which uses dates and then when the writings occurred in the Old Testament, what was happening in the Bible at that time, what was happening in world history, the kings of the United Kingdom, the Northern Kingdom, the Southern Kingdom, the prophets, etc. Okay, this is another valuable tool. It does the same thing as this, except this has got a few more words to help explain it. I'll get you copies of this for next week. All right? Because I think several people, several people came back to me and said this is one of the coolest things they've seen. Because one sheet of paper, as long as you have a magnifying glass, I know it's small, but the point is if it's not on one piece of paper, it doesn't really help. If you're going to have to flip back and forth, you might as well just have a book on it. Okay, having it all together in one place, even if you have to use a magnifying glass, is very helpful because then you can see the relationship between things. Right? Dave? It reads a lot easier if you print it in black and white. Yeah, they said that if you photocopy it in black and white or print it in black and white, then, and it is on the website too, you know, you can pull it up there. Um, but these kinds of things help give us sort of a, a big perspective. It helps us see the relationship with stuff. One of the problems when we read the Bible without resources and without study is you get these bits and pieces of things that don't make a whole lot of sense unless you understand something about the context. Um, the stories of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't make a whole lot of sense unless you understand what happened when the southern kingdom of Israel, or of Judah, excuse me, the southern kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians, and then Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylonia, or Babylon, took 
these princes, the very best of the young people, back to live in Babylon and wanted to turn them into good Babylonians and what the response was. And then, right after Nebuchadnezzar's time, his son comes on actually, his grandson comes along, then you get uh, the Persians conquer them. And then you get Cyrus the Great letting all the Jews go back. And if you understand that history a little bit, then the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, where the Jews go back and rebuild first the temple and then the walls of the city of Jerusalem, all of that begins to fit together and make sense once you have a historical perspective. And these charts and diagrams and timelines and maps and stuff help you get that. And they're all in one book. Okay? Questions about any of that? All right. In terms of what else is in here, NIV not only has all the stuff, but they've even done us the favor of, come on, keep going, describing them to you. There's the quick start guide, and this is just in the new NIV. Um, then you get the introduction to the NIV study Bible, where they talk about the study notes. There's 20,000 study notes, which are the things at the bottom. We're going to look at those in just a second. Um, they have um, icons, little, little icons, um, that tell you if there's a trowel somewhere in, in, along the Bible by a footnote, that tells you that archaeological evidence has been used to help understand this. If there is a plant, then that means that it's a practical principle that you can apply to your own life to grow. If it is sort of a person's outline, that means it's some information or description about a person or a people. So they've even got little icons to help you understand what's going on as you go through here. There are that I talked about the introductions. There are text notes, cross-references we're going to look at, parallel passages, a concordance, the largest concordance ever put in a English bound with an English Bible. You get the charts, essays, topics, uh, notes and map indexes, the harmony of the gospel that I mentioned. They explain how they use the divine name of Yahweh. I said to you before, the standard, which they, they continue here, is that if Yahweh, the proper name of God, all right, the Hebrew four character, the tetragrammaton, the proper four letter Hebrew name of God, Yahweh, we call it, if that's used, then they use small, um, small capitals. L -O -R, for Lord, L-O-R-D, but in small capitals. If it's capital L and then small O-R-D, then that means it's probably Elohim, which is a generic word that means Lord, or Adonai. Okay, Elohim means a generic for God, Adonai is generic for Lord. But Lord with capital, you know, small capitals, is Yahweh, that's the proper name of God. And they explain all that, okay? Um, we're gonna take a break. And then when we come back, we're going to actually, I'm going to show you a couple more things in here, and then we're going to start using it. So, it's three minutes after now. Uh, let's come back together at 10 after 2. Thank you, index. Whoops. <laughs> then you have the index to notes. What this means is we're going to look at the footnotes in a minute, the study notes. At the bottom of every page where there is text of the Bible, there are study notes. Anywhere that a reference, content, anything is in either study notes or charts or maps or book introductions or essays or anything else, it'll be identified here in this index to the notes. So it's not referring to the actual words in, this, in the scripture text. It's not referring topically, although it gets to the same material. It's telling you where there's explanatory notes it refers you back to in the Bible. For instance, let's look at Abraham again, right in the middle of the page here. Okay, you can look up passages having now. In this case, it gives you the scripture verse, but it's referring you to the notes that are connected to that scripture verse. For instance, his call is referred to in Acts seven, verse two. If you go to Acts seven two and look at the study notes at the bottom, it will talk about Abraham's call. If you want to find out about Abraham and the church, you go to Galatians 6, 16, and there will be something in those notes about him. Uh, circumcision, Genesis, John, and Romans. Um, Abraham and his descendants, from Genesis to Luke, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, and eternity, etc., etc. And then, if you get over here on the right-hand column, 
It's got the Abrahamic covenant, one of the great covenants that our Old Testament theology class is going to talk about next week. You can hear all about the covenant God made with Abraham, and there's an article called, or a chart actually, the major covenants of the Old Testament. And right there, I see that under Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, and it says, turn to page 23. So turn to page 23 in your Bibles. We could do this as a sword drill. Y'all ever had sword drills when you were kids? I was in a Baptist, I got saved in the Baptist church, and they used to have sword drills, which is, you know, they call out a verse in whichever kid got to it first. Uh, okay, that's a sword drill. Draw your sword. Page 23, Genesis 9-11, the major covenants in the Old Testament. Now, I got here because I looked up Abraham and saw the Abrahamic covenant, and it referred me to this chart. It talks about the Noahic covenant, the first Abrahamic covenant, the second Abrahamic covenant, the Sinaitic covenant, also called the Mosaic covenant, the Phineas covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the New covenant. All of those are different covenants. It tells me where they are, what kind of covenant they were. We'll get into the suzerain vassal covenant kind of stuff later. Who was involved, and then it describes it. And then down below, it, it com compares those biblical covenants to the kinds of covenant agreements that existed in the ancient Near East and other civilizations. Wow. That's huge to be able to look all that up. Okay? So that's the index to notes. It will take you to not the words in the passages, but to the notes and articles and charts and maps and other things that refer to that. <coughs> now, the third kind of tool I want to refer you to in the back is on page 2362, which is the concordance. This concordance contains 4,795 distinct word entries with 36,000 scripture references. It actually, if you look up a word, it will tell you where that word occurs in, in the NIV, in this translation, and give you a section of that passage so that you, if you're looking for a certain verse and you know that it's got a word in it, this not only will let you look up that word and see where it occurs, but you can read those brief descriptions and nine times out of ten, that'll tell you what you're looking for. So you can go straight to it. Okay? Let me give you an example. Let's say um, you, well, we've got Abraham here again. Abraham is on the right-hand page, that's 2363, and it gives you all kinds of different references to different events in his life and particulars about him and the scripture verses. It goes up into the next column. But then pick out a word. Let's say, look at accept, which is toward the bottom of the middle column on the right-hand page, page 2363. If you look up accept, it also tells you variances of that are acceptable, acceptance, accepted, and accepts. Those each come after this, but they're all related. Um, Exodus 23.8, uh, not, do not accept a bribe for a bribe blinds. Deuteronomy 16.19, uh, do not accept a bribe for a bribe blinds. That tells you there are two passages there in Exodus and Deuteronomy that say exactly the same thing. Um, Job 42.8, uh, and I will accept his prayer and not deal, something. Proverbs 10.8, the wise in heart accept commands. 1920, the wise in heart accept commands. I'm sorry, listen to the advice and, uh, and accept discipline, etc., etc. So anywhere, you, and, and if you're doing a topical study, like that's, as I say, that's one of the uh, kinds of Bible studies that Rick Warren talks about, you can either go to the topical index in your own Bible and look up, say, the word anger. Okay? In fact, I did that very thing. If you go to the topical index in your Bible and you uh, look up anger, which is on page 2191, you will get passages on human anger expressed by such people as Cain, Jacob, Moses, Saul, David, Naaman, Nehemiah, and Jonah. This is, this is a topic that, that as an example, um, Rick Warren was saying you might use as a topical study. Control of our anger. Passages related to that. The anger of Jesus at injustice, at the misuse of God's house in the final judgment. The anger of God, um, etc., etc. You could either go to the topical index and look up anger, or you could go to this concordance and look up the word anger to see exactly where that word appears. Not just general topical references, but the exact word. 
All of these things are in the Bible that you're holding in your lap or on your table or in your hands. Susan? My Bible is older than the one that David has. Right? I don't have a topical index. I have a topical index subjects. Is that the same? That should be the same thing. Yeah. Um, subjects, topics, topic and themes are all the same thing. Now again, if you don't have the latest version of the NIV Study Bible, yours won't look exactly like this. But if you've got a good study Bible, it should still have the basic kinds of tools, some better than others. I like the NIV not only because it's the most common translation available, but it does have the same scholars that translated the NIV did the study aids in it. There are some, we were just talking about that, there are some, some study Bibles that will use the NIV translation, but they have a different set of scholars who do the aids. That doesn't mean they're worse, it just means they're different, they're not the same. But the same basic elements are going to be in there. You get into some of them, like the Life Application Study Bible, which you have, and which I have. Um, it will focus especially not on topics like the... It, it won't have a whole lot of stuff about, for instance, the ancient extra-biblical texts. Because the focus of the Life Application Study Bible is, how does this stuff apply to my life? And so all of their study aids are oriented toward that, which can be a really good thing. That's why I also have a Life Application Study Bible. <laughs> But if I had to choose, I think the NIV Study Bible does a lot of that. Plus, it gives you a lot of the scholarly stuff, a lot of the chronologies and timelines and things that I think help you get a, a broad understanding. And if I didn't say this before, the reason I'm doing this is because I don't know if, that we're talking about all these things today in this book is because if you don't get anything else out of this class other than an understanding and a commitment to use this book, and this book is exactly like your hard downloads, I just got a soft cover one so I'm flinging at people. <laughs> um, the, if you don't do anything else out of this How to Study the Bible class other than learn how to use this book, the tools that are in it, and commit yourself to that, if you don't do any of the K. Arthur stuff, which you should, but if you don't, you'll still be miles ahead. Because this one book, which is why I require that people are in certificate of degree purchase it, this one book will give you 90% of all the tools you could possibly use in order to grow in your understanding of the Word. Are you seeing that? So I think that's why I think it's worth spending time on. Yes? Uh, the topics, is that just about the same as these no. scriptures? No. Okay. Those are cross references. And we're going to get to that in just, in fact, next. I want you now to go to go to page 1756, which is the introduction to the Gospel of John. I'm gonna, we're going to look at a specific passage now, but I want to set it up for you. Introduction to the Gospel of John, 1756. It's a good year. <laughs> All right, this is the four-page, actually five-page introduction to the Gospel of John. Every book has an introduction like this. You will notice that it has um, definition of the author is the first. The author is the, is the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and it gives you John 13, 23. See note there. So it refers you to other sources inside the Bible that will help you. Uh, and then has some other passages. He was prominent in the early church, but is not mentioned by name in this gospel. Well, he wrote it, so he didn't refer to himself by name. He calls himself the apostle whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, excuse me. Um, it goes on telling you some more about him, what early writers such as Arrhenius and Tertullian, um, confirming that John wrote this gospel. Then it talks about the date. When was it written? It gives you two options. The traditional view, which put it at the end of the first century, around AD 85 or later. But then, more recently, some interpreters have suggested an earlier date, perhaps as early as the 50s, and no later than 70. Well, in this case, that's not a big deal, because either way, they're saying John wrote it. John lived longer than any of the other apostles. He, by according to tradition, he is the only one of the apostles that died by natural causes. All the others were martyred in some way. John died at a ripe old age in Ephesus, okay. uh, after having spent time imprisoned on the rock of Patmos, where he wrote the, the Revelation. But this gives you author, date, including two variations of the date, and why they would recommend one over the other. Then you'll notice just to the right there, a quick look. 
this little box here has all the a real quick version of all the key data. The author, the audience, who was he writing to? Primarily Gentile believers and, un, and seeking unbelievers. The date, the theme, what is this book about? Jesus, uh, John presents Jesus as the Word, the Messiah, the incarnate Son of God, who has come to reveal the Father and bring eternal life to all who believe in Him. That's what this whole book's about. Then up here on the, the right, the, the sort of uh, bar up there, it's got a statement. The literary style of this witness of Jesus, that is the Gospel of John, is unique among the Gospels. Here focuses on the signs, quote unquote, of Jesus' identity and mission and on, um, and on lengthy theological rich discourses. I said earlier, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels, those three, which means same seeing, because they're all basically telling the story of Jesus. Not necessarily in the same order, because that was the Hebrew style of writing, but still pretty consistent. John is a theological work. It's not written the same from the same approach as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's got different expectations, and they identify there. It is theologically rich discussion, or discourses. Then we go down um, purpose and emphasis. They go into detail there. And they've also got very cool pictures and, and captions along. The next page, it gets into more about the purpose, and then a full outline. It does say, for the main emphasis of the book, See notes on uh, chapter 1, verses 4, 7, 9, 14, 19, 49, and for chapter 2, 4, 11, 3, 27, etc. So it's taking you to places where you can get the major focus. And then it has a full outline of everything. So if you're going, you know, I'm looking for that thing, and I know it's in the Gospel of John, where blah, blah happens. Well, you've got an extensive outline here over the next two pages that will help you with that. Right? Any questions about that introductory kind of material? There's similar stuff everywhere throughout this, for every book in the Bible. Now, the Psalms are not outlined in the same way because Psalms, right? They're, they're sayings. It's kind of hard to outline it in that same kind of way. But uh, basically, it's all there. Now, what I want to do is to look at the next page, the right hand page, which is the first chapter of the book of John. And I want to show you how this works. You will notice. There's three main, actually four main sections to this page. There is the text of Scripture, which starts with chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This and this are the actual Bible words. Everything else on this page is a study aid. Alright? There's three kinds of study aids here. The most obvious one are the ones at the bottom, which are study notes. They are explaining the verses up above. For instance, 1-1 one, one in, the, in the Bible passage, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you come down here, you'll see two things first. A little green sort of plant icon and a people icon. Do you remember what those stand for? <laughs> Application to your life is the green one of the little plant. How you can grow with this, in other words. And the other one is what? It's telling you about a person or people. And it says, um, in the beginning, it takes that as parentheses. So they're saying this part of the passage, a deliberate echo of Genesis 1.1, and by the way, GE is the abbreviation for Genesis. If you, if you can't figure out the abbreviations in the first part of the Bible, there's, there's a page that tells you all the abbreviations they use on one page. So you can look it up. This is a deliberate echo of Genesis 1-1, see note there. Somebody turn to Genesis 1-1. You know what that is? Where is it? In the beginning. Who's there? Okay, read what Genesis 1-1 note says. What does the note say down below? Down at the bottom. Right, here. right read loud. In the ancient Near East, most of the peoples had myths relating how the world came to be. Keep going. Yep. Prevalent in those myths were accounts of how one of the gods tri triumphed over, over, over a fierce and powerful beast that represented disorder, then fashioned the order, ordered world that people knew, and finally was proclaimed by the other gods to be divine king 
over the world he had created. Okay, let's stop right there. It goes on. How many of you all were in our theology class on Wednesday? What did I teach you about? Creation myths. And how other, how other creation myths, because as long as there have been people, they've been trying to figure out how did all this happen? Where did this all come from? And you have other creation myths where you've got other gods, usually it's, they're struggling and it's hard and there are multiple gods and they're fighting each other, like the Enuma Elish, the, the ancient Akkadian or Babylonian um, creation epic, which has the god Marduk rising up out of the primordial uh, chaotic waters and she, he fights Tiamat, a female god, tears her in two, half of her becomes the heavens, half of her becomes the earth, and then he uses other parts of her anatomy to create other parts of creation that I don't want to know about. Um, but this is, you just heard basically that right there. And that, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's scholarly information about how that fits in, and that you, you were referred to that by John 1, which starts out, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the footnotes continue. I mean, there's, there's another 20 lines just on 1-1 one, one, down below there. I'm not going to have you read all of that right now, out loud, but you get the idea. Now, so, the first part of this page is the actual Scripture part, which is up here. The second part are these notes, and you will notice in each case, they are linked to a certain verse. If you're reading along here and you go, oh, well, I want to know more about that, look down here and see if there is a passage in the footnotes that has that verse on it. You've got 1, 1, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 1, 7, 1, 8, 1, 9, 1, 12, 1, 13, 1, 14, all have study notes just on this one page. And in some cases, they will refer you back you know, to other, other sources of information that are within the Bible. Now, so that's the second part of this. The third part I will mention is right here. These little things. Um, well, I'm sorry. In this case, it's right there. You see that um, if we read on down, verse 5 reads, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You will notice that there is a little um, a. a right there, and this is kind of hard to, I'm looking at this from having copied it smaller than it actually is in the Bible. Um, anytime there is a variant reading, or I've got mine here if I just looked it up, a variant reading, or there is a word that could have been translated one way or the other, or some other explanation is needed. An example would be in... Um, in Exodus, where uh, Moses is, as a baby, is saved by Pharaoh's daughter, and then later, in, in, through the, the wisdom of this, the being on her toes of his sister Miriam, gets taken back to his own mother as a wet nurse to take care of him, and then later he comes back when he gets a little bit older, doesn't need a wet nurse anymore, to live with Pharaoh's daughter. And it says, and Pharaoh named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. Well, a little footnote right there, just like this one, says Moses sounds like the Hebrew for draws out. And it explains that. What does that passage mean? In this case, the, uh, verse 5 says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The passage here tells you that another translation of that word could be understood it. Well, they made a decision that this seems like the best translation for that, uh, that Greek word, but they gave you the alternative, reading right there. So that's the third kind of aid. In this case, there's only one. In some kinds of cases, you'll have lines of that. Yes, sir. I've got four in the 2002 version of the NIV. Four? Four of the things where they said, here's another wording. Okay, well, how much text do you have on that page? Do you go through verse 14 or is there more? Goes through 14. Okay, great. But I'm just saying that they have four variations. On well, the new edition, the new edition yeah. may have may have incorporated those changes. Exactly. In the or that may they may have kind of gone to another document and decided, and decided which, which, which one was right. And you don't need to know right. Exactly. Scholars have to make decisions about these things. Okay. So that's one. Um, was it? Yeah, right. Uh, would you refer to that then as alphabetical? Um, that's coded with the alphabet. 
Well, you mean in terms of the, the like the letter A? Yeah. Yeah, if there were 10 of them, it would be A through J. Okay. And it was, it's, they're italicized. It's a little hard sometimes. You sometimes have to sort of look back and forth because there's a bunch of stuff going on on this page and it can be a little confusing until you get used to it. All right? So that's the first thing on this page, or actually the Bible text. The second is the study notes. The third are the alternate readings or explanations of some of the words. And the fourth is this thing that goes down the middle, and in this case it goes down the middle and then it leaks over here. If there's not enough room in the center column, then it follows over here. These are the cross-references. Down below, it tells you something about this, and in some cases where it's very appropriate, they'll tell you see a note on Genesis 1-1 in this case. But in every case, in that center, it will refer you to other verses in the Bible that are relevant to this. So that if you're doing a study, and you want to see, oh, well, uh, let's see, for instance, Isaiah 55.11. Somebody look up Isaiah 55.11. I have done this. Um, um, this is an act of faith for me. <laughs> Isaiah 55.11. That's... That's what's linked. The first link to the verse in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Who's got it? Michael, read it out loud. It says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Okay. The Word, God says, my Word which proceeds out of my mouth will accomplish the things that I intend for it when I sent it. I just paraphrased that. I hope that was an accurate paraphrase. Can you see the relevance of that passage as supporting the idea that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God? And a little bit later, you're going you're to read that it says that the Word was responsible for creating everything that is. The Word, the word of God is more than just a palabra, okay, if you speak Spanish. It's more than just saying, you know, this, this collection of letters. Word, the Greek, the Greek word actually, and if you read some of these other passages, it would explain that if you read some of the notes. The Greek word, in fact, I think it does. Um, the Greek word, the word logos in Greek is a term Greeks use not only for the spoken word, but also of the unspoken word, the word that is still in the mind, or the reason. So when we say that theology is the, is the study of the word of God, we don't just mean the Bible. Theology is the reasoning of God. It's the thought of God. It's a focus on, on the intent of God, all the things of God, based upon the fact that theology, theologos, God, word, you have to have some understanding of what the, the, the word logos, the Greek word for word, actually means. And when you understand that, which you can from these footnotes and from some of these other uh, cross-references, then you have a much richer understanding of what that passage means when it talks about the Word of God, the Word who was with God and the Word was God. Now you see how sermons get written? <laughs> Uh -huh. You know, it, it also, one big help these references cause is <laughs> let us see things in, in its context. A lot of people interpret this verse apart from all the rest of the right. narrative, you know, and when you see what, what other scriptures say, it really adds to an accurate interpretation of what, what that verse means. Absolutely, which is one of the reasons I gave you that article on is your modern translation corrupt? And one of the reasons I'm showing this to you is because when you see the extent to which these Bible scholars have gone, to give you every other possible reference to this topic, you know, the Word, and every other verse that they can identify that relates to it or connects to it or else expanded or whatever, to accuse them of intentionally corrupting things to try to mislead you? Get a job. You know, I don't think so. What you just said, that it really does, it show, it verifies, it strengthens our understanding, and that's, this is not the act of people who are trying to mislead you. Do you work for Zondervan? I don't. The <laughs> Republic, I, I, I used to work for Republica, you know, the, the International Bible Society, and they have the rights for this. But uh, I, I helped them with raising funds in order to do Bible ministry things, where they gave away Bibles. And you sell them. very good. <laughs> That's my job. Uh, one way or the other. Okay, um, let's go to the next verse. He was with God in the beginning. All right? That's the second verse. He was with God in the beginning. If you go over to the right, 
you'll see it has Genesis 1:1. In the beginning was the word. Uh, in the beginning, God created. But then it has John 8:58. Do you see that? Center column reference under 1, 2, as Genesis 1, 1. And then it has John 8, 58. Somebody look up John 8, 58 for me. We're in the Gospel of John already, so just a little bit ahead of that. Wanda, read it out loud. 8, 58. Don't raise your hands until you're ready. Surely I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Okay. He was with God in the beginning. And it takes you to the passage in John where Jesus said, Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, there's several things going on there. If you look at that passage and you, you look at the reference from that passage, it'll take you back to Genesis or to Exodus 3, where God, when Moses asked him for his name, says, Tell the Israelites, I am who I am. Tell them, I am sent you. Jesus is saying there, I am God, I am Yahweh, I am the eternal one of Israel, and I have existed since before Abraham. Now you got to that and you see the links between in all that by starting with this passage in John 1. Jane. So technically then you would go to this passage in John, there may be something listed in the middle column on that, correct me? Correct, so you've got quite a path. Oh, yeah, you can keep going forever. For instance, Wanda, you're on uh, um, John 8.58. What is the center reference off John 8.58? Oh, yes. oh, just, oh, yeah. went away. But that again? Got it. Okay. okay, what's the passage? I'm betting you it's Exodus 3.20. 3.14. 314. 3.14. Okay, that's close. <laughs> right? That's where God tells Moses what his name is. I am. I can quote it to you. You don't need to read it. Um, but you see the point. As you and that, you could you could do this forever and starve, you know, by never going into your kitchen again. That's not the point. The idea, though, is when you get involved in Bible study in this book alone, without and I love all this other stuff. I equipped a whole church with the books I gave away when I left Seattle. Carolyn will tell you. Um, but this one volume will allow you to do an almost infinite amount of study of God's Word. If you, if you use it, how many of you had no clue what the center references were for before today in your Bibles? Did you, did you know? Good for you. And God bless you too for being the only honest ones in the room. <laughs> no, most people see that stuff there and they go, I don't know what that little type is all about. But... I wish you didn't have to read around it. Okay. <laughs> that stuff is very valuable. Yes. What's Harry? the little letters like at the end? When you get to the word word, there's a little A and then God a little B. Um, that is actually referring you to the specifics. For instance, in the beginning was the word, it's got an A. The A is over here on 1-1. One, one. It tells you that's Isaiah 55-11 and Revelation 19-13. Oh, okay, okay. The, the B is referred to John 17. So those are sort of subsets underneath the verses. Okay. That's how fine a detail they're giving you on this that you can follow it up. I take my glasses off because my print's smaller than yours. Okay. Um, especially those little tiny letters. Questions about any of that? Is it cool? Yes. Are you going to use it? Yes. You promise? Yes. Raise your right hand. <laughs> now, you can. Who does not have the NIV study Bible? Who's using some other kind of Bible? Okay. I mean, not right now. Um, you're using the NIV study Bible, right? Is anybody else using a different one? Well, that's the NIV study Bible, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just. Just, and again, I'm acting on faith here. Uh, if I go to John 1 here, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, this is using the HCSB translation. The footnote here says the Word, capital W Word, Greek logos, is a title for Jesus as the communication and the revealer of God the Father. He is the, the, the reasoning of God, the thought of God, that reveals God, if you will. And in this case, John is calling him the Word. It goes on, um, verses 
three to four other punctuation is possible, um, et cetera, and it, well, it goes on. And then at the bottom, if this one's got a little box called on the logos. And like the related verb, lego, to speak. Did you know lego meant to speak in Greek? I didn't. Lego meant lego. Yeah. The noun logos <laughs> must often refer to either oral or written communication, et cetera. And it goes on. I mean, I'm just telling you that whatever study Bible you have, if you don't have the NIV study Bible, there's still an enormous amount of value in it. I think the one that's got the most, just by weight, is the NIV <laughs> study Bible. It's got, it's got more of the resources and things than, than any of the others, and that's why I recommend it. Questions or comments? I want to give you some time to... Are you... Ron. I really appreciate this lecture, because we've had our share of Bible studies, and it was never explained that you've got a Bible. This is really clarified. Good. Well, I'm glad. Again, there's, there are huge tools in any of them. Um, which of you, um, Rachel or Mickey, one of the Bibles I just gave you, the reading Bible, open it up. Just open it up anywhere. You see the center column references? No. Okay. Are there not center column on that one? No. Am I forgetting? Oh, there's not. I thought there were on that one. Because my reading Bible, I do have that. Um, most, most are all Bibles. Now, these are pew Bibles, and they're not intended to be used like this study Bibles, and so that's why they don't have that. But um, almost any Bible that you have, even if it doesn't have all the notes and the indexes and the concordance and all that, will at least have the cross-reference things in the middle. Almost every Bible. Mine are on the side. Yours are on the side. Okay, some of them, you know, Pat's got a Bible where they put the copy together, and then they've got it on the center columns on either side of the in each page. So, but, but those are valuable, and most people never even think about what they're for. They're just there. Okay. Yes? Russ, are you going to explain how to use the Strong's? Well, I'm not, because the, it's, it, it's basically the... It's a, it's a big brother example of the concordance that's in here. The only, the only real difference in terms of how to use it is Strong's concordance and the uh, NIV, or I'm sorry, the Vines, um, which is the Greek, there's a Vines Greek and a Vines uh, Hebrew, which looks at the original language, they actually have numbers. Every, if you look in here, in this exhaustive concordance, on the Strong's exhaustive concordance is to the King James, I mentioned once before, there is an NIV version of this that uses the NIV words, which is called the strongest NIV concordance. And if you look in the right-hand column, for instance, they have the word wisely. In Exodus 1.10, come on, let us deal wisely with him. And they have the number 2,449. Every Greek and Hebrew word is numbered in the Bible, in the King James. And so, if you look up the word wisely anywhere else, for instance, the next passage, 1 Samuel 18.5 says, sent him and behaved himself wisely. But the number 7919, that tells you that while both of those passages, the word that was used was translated wisely, it's not the same Hebrew word. And so from there, you can go back to vines, uh, words, word index of Hebrew words, and look up those two words and see everywhere those two words are used and what the possible very subtle meaning is. English... In some ways, English is a very subtle language. In some ways, it's just a confused language. <laughs> but there are some languages that have a subtlety of meaning that we don't capture. You all have heard the example, you know, that in, in Inuit, in the Eskimo language, there's 29 different words for snow, or whatever it is, 17 or 22. Anyway, there are a lot of different words for snow because for them, snow is a big deal. <laughs> It's, it's everyday life, and so for them, the difference between a freezing snow or a powdered snow or a crusty snow makes a difference in whether or not you're going to be able to go polar bear hunting in the morning. And so they have a lot of different words for snow. We don't have that subtlety. What's that? Or a whiteout snow. Or a whiteout snow. <laughs> dangerous snow. Okay. We don't have that same subtlety. Well, every language has particular areas in which they have subtleties. Hebrew and Greek, very much so. Uh, Latin is a, is a very succinct language. It's not a hard language. The rules are quite simple. It's very direct. Um, uh, um, 
J.I. Packer was my professor studying Calvin's Institutes, and Packer told me once, I told him I'd love to study Latin more, and he said, if you learn Latin, your thinking will clear. Because Latin, the nature of that language is that it is very direct, it is very succinct, you don't mess around. There's not a lot of subtlety in Latin per se. That's why you get, you know, you get a, a 15 word sentence in English and you read the Latin version of it and it's five words. You know, cognito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, you know, kind of thing. But it's, there's always a, a sort of very directness about it. Hebrew, because of the poetic nature of Hebrew, can have a lot of subtlety to it. And so, the word wisely that I just picked, there are a number of different words that would be translated that, that way in English that might have subtle differences if you dig into it. So when you look up vines, which I don't have with me today, if you looked up that those numbers and that word, in uh, it would give you all the different ways that it's used and what the, what the differences are. You know, that there's a kind of wisely which means that you're you're relating well to your boss. So there's a kind of wisely which means that you are righteous in your de in your decisions. And there's a kind of wisely that means whatever. Okay, you see my point. Mm -hmm. Most of what I just said I made up, but you get the point. Okay. Um, questions about that? I'm not going to get into the detail of that. Um, if, if you, those things are valuable. If you get into the original languages, if you get into parsing. Um, Parsing is when you actually identify the, the word structure and the use of words in sentences. You talk about parsing the Greek. That's where you arc between different words and different meanings and how they how they modify the modifiers within a sentence and you know the whole it's a very complicated kind of thing. It's not something I intend for us to get into, although I've got a couple of young people in this group who really want me to. For me to, to get to the point where I again could deal in any reasonable way with the Hebrew and the Greek at that level. Kill me now. Um, Roz. Was that in ever a widely spoken language or was it mainly a written language? I mean, Greeks spoke Greek, but the Romans spoke Greek, and then the Hebrews spoke Greek, and they didn't speak Hebrew much anymore. <laughs> um, then in the synagogue, they used Hebrew, but then the scholars also wrote in Latin. Actually, Latin was widely spoken. Yeah. For the Romans, Latin was the spoken language. Unless you were a scholar, and then you would use Greek, because the Latins come along because Greek has more subtlety, has more poetry. Latin was, you know, Latin was the language of people who, who built arches and bridges and roads. You know, Greek was the language of the people who invented philosophy and poetry and, you know, and, and uh, medicine and architecture. So the Romans always spoke Latin. The Romans spoke Latin. Latin is a descendant language from ancient Etruscan. Basically, which is on the which is part of Italy, uh, when the Roman Empire, when the Romans, you know, got uppity and started taking over other parts of the world, they then were confronted with Greek, which was an older language, or in terms of its established, and they saw the benefit of it and started using it, just like they saw the benefit of the Greek gods, and they adopted them and so much else. But Latin was an everyday working language that people really did use, and you do have a lot of the. A lot of the histories, the histories of the Punic War and the writings of Seneca and all these other things, were written in Latin. So Latin was a real used language. It became a dead language as a spoken language. And so, you know, it, it's one of the dead languages. Um, Greek has never been a dead language because there always have been countries and cultures that spoke Greek as their common language. Latin, because Greek was a more common language when, when Rome went into decline, then Latin died out as a spoken language, but we still have massive libraries of stuff that was written in Latin. Hebrew was a dead language. Yeah. It was revived as a living language by the nation of Israel, one of the extraordinary things that Israel did when they became a nation again in the 1940s. But there still are words in Hebrew that we don't know how to pronounce in ancient Hebrew. We lost how to pronounce them because for a long, long time it was not a spoken language. If it's not a spoken language, it was still a written language. If it's not a spoken language, you forget how to pronounce them because uh, written, ancient written, written languages didn't have con have vowels. They were only written in consonants, and vowels are the sounds, the breathing sounds, a, e, i, o. And without them, you don't know for sure how to pronounce things. We don't know for sure that Yahweh is how you spell or how they spell or how they pronounce the proper name of God. It could be different.
Um, it's one of the reasons why we got confused over read C or a red C. You know, which is it? Because you didn't write the constant, the, you didn't write the vowels in each of the three. Was there a read C? Yes. Yeah. Um, we'll have to come to our survey class. <laughs> <laughs> we, never, we never actually established where the read C was. Well, we had the red C and then the other, you know, like they went either across that bit or across that bit. But I forgot to ask then, where was the read C? Well, read C was a, was a reference to bodies of water that reach grew in, and that was common there. Whether it was lakes that were there, or whether it was part of the Nile Delta, or whatever it was. Okay. So. Any other questions or comments about this stuff? Are you going to get excited about using your NIV study Bibles now? Yeah. Yeah. Any of the people that I loaned a book to, I would really appreciate if you either pay me for it or give it back to me, because I did pay for those out of my, well, out of Carolyn's own pocket. <laughs> <laughs> they're all mine. Yes, they're all Carolyn, so pay her if you want. Yeah. All right, uh, let me close in prayer. Go ahead and turn it off, and I'll close in prayer.